I'm Dennis Charney. I'm the dean at the Icon School of Medicine. And today, uh, we have a great program uh, for you where we're going to talk about what we're calling consequences for the heart, what every heart patient needs to know about COVID-19 and the future of cardiology. But before we begin that, I want to tell you, in a sense, a, a bit of a story about what happened when the tsunami of COVID-19 hit Mount Sinai. You know, in early March, we had, uh, you know, very few patients uh, with COVID-19. But, uh, but then an enormous number of patients starting to hit Mount Sinai, you know, with a peak of over 2,100 patients uh, infected by the virus on April 9th. And so we had to respond uh, dramatically to take care of these very sick patients. What did we do? We redeployed many of our doctors uh, to uh, take care of these patients. Many nurses were redeployed to take care of these patients. They were very sick. We had to add hospital beds, including in our lobby. Uh, there was a, a new hospital uh, in, in Central Park. It was unprecedented, the challenge that was facing Mount Sinai, our doctors, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our environmental health workers. And, you know, when the virus hit, it was a disease that very few throughout the world knew how to treat it. So we had to learn as we were taking care of these very sick patients. We had to understand, you know, where the virus um, was going in our body. Was it hitting the heart, the kidneys, the liver, uh, the brain? What was the best way to treat it? When should we use a ventilator? What were the right medicines to use uh, to treat this terrible illness? Mount Sinai essentially was the epicenter of the epicenter. What did we do? Well, one of the first things we did is we developed perhaps the best antibody assay in the world where we now are able to quantify how many antibodies somebody has and ultimately will learn, depending on how many antibodies you have in, in reaction to the virus, will that confer immunity? And if it does, how long will it confer immunity? We also began to learn where the virus was going. As you'll hear from uh, our eminent uh, physicians, we found that clotting was a problem unexpected. And so then we developed a treatment for the clotting using anticoagulation uh, drugs. New medicines were um, identified that might treat the virus as an antiviral agent, like remdesivir. We found that if you give antibodies, that that could particularly help very seriously ill uh, patients. So, so it literally, it was an amazing experience with a lot of uh, heroism, bravery, that at least in my lifetime, in 40 years as being a doctor, I had never seen before. So we have a lot to be proud of. We learned so much. And now, uh, even though the number of patients uh, with, with the uh, COVID-19 infection is much lower, we will be prepared if another wave occurs, a second wave, a third wave, uh, uh, and so forth, because we at Mount Sinai have learned so much about this disease. So let me talk now about who you're going to hear from uh, today, our experts in cardiology. First, you're going to hear from Dr. Valentin Fuster, Director of Mount Sinai Heart and Physician-in-Chief at Mount Sinai Hospital, a good friend of mine, very good friend. And I have to say, I think he's the best cardiologist in the world. You're also going to hear from David Adams, cardiac surgeon in chief of the Mount Sinai Health System, professor and system chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgeon. I'm not shy about saying I think he's the best mitral valve surgeon in the world. You will also hear from Dr. Samin Sharma, senior vice president of operations and quality for Mount Sinai Heart and direct, director of interventional cardiology for the Mount Sinai Health System. I'm not shy about saying 
Perhaps nobody in the world is a better interventional cardiologist than Samin Sharma. You will then hear from Mary Ann McLaughlin, Director of Cardiovascular Health and Wellness at Mount Sinai Heart. Mary Ann is dedicated, perhaps more than anybody else, to cardiac health in women, which is an underserved uh, area of research and clinical care. And then you will hear from Dr. Vivek Reddy, Director of Cardiac Arrhythmia Services and Professor of Cardiac Electrophysiology. Again, perhaps the best of any cardiac arrhythmia expert in the world, developing new approaches to treating life-threatening um, arrhythmi arrhythmias of the heart. You're going to hear from him. And finally, you will hear from Dr. Anu Lala, Director of Heart Failure Research at Mount Sinai. And this is an area that's very important to our health system because cardiac failure can lead to very serious problems, including in some patients needing uh, a transplant of the heart. So, you know, let's start to hear from our experts. First, Dr. Valentin Fuster. Tell me what it was like uh, in dealing with the pandemic as a world-class, world-leading cardiologist. What, it, what was it like for you as an individual? And what would, did we learn over time about the effect of COVID-19 uh, on the heart? Dr. Fuster. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, this is, uh, thank you very much for your words and introduction. I will say that um, I have two main comments here. Well, the first one is what happened in mid-March. In mid-March, you could see patients coming into the hospital, a mortality, people dying, 10, 12 patients a day, and was absolutely dramatic. And the first question that we thought about is how we could communicate among us. And here comes a very important issue, the issue of integration of the system and integration of people. So what we decided to do is to have a daily phone call with my international colleagues in Spain and in Italy, because they were about two or three weeks ahead of us into what uh, this pandemic was taking place. And then what we did is we communicated every day, actually for three months, every day with the faculty, with the non-faculty personnel, uh, with the fellows, and certainly with everybody who work in cardiology and the nurses. And I think the first comment I want to make is uh, what an incredible experience. How easy is it to integrate people when there is good communication? And this is the first point I want to say. Over many years that I have served this institution, very loyal to the institution, I have never seen people so well integrated and trying to help each other. This is, this is my first point. And my second point is about research. You have people dying every day. What do you do? Well, it turned out that I had two patients with clots in the legs. And then there was a paper from China saying that clotting was important perhaps in this disease as one of the mechanisms that was killing people. So this was intuitive. We decided that from this stage of observation to move into policy. So we decided that everybody at Mount Sinai that was going to be admitted with COVID would be treated with anticoagulants. It was intuitive. We didn't have the data. We just said, we have to do something about it. And this led to the next stage, and that is, let's find out what happened. So what we studied is 3,000 of these individuals, and we found that blood thinners certainly decreased mortality. This led to the policy number two. We thought that the, the, the degree of anticoagulation was not sufficient and should be increased. So we increased the dose, and here was the second policy. Everybody treated with anticoagulants at the right dose. And this led to the next stage, which is now 6,000 people with COVID. And now we have, is under review, but we have fantastic information. Just to tell you, we see like close to 50% mortality decrease with the right use of anticoagulants at the right dose. And there are six different types of anticoagulation. And this now is leading us to develop a project which will be for the future and that is to start from the beginning, two groups of people treated with different anticoagulants and move forward. 
I think I want to finish by saying to you, uh, Dennis, that uh, the, the, the sense of integration is so fulfilling. The fact that you're working with a team of people and then with a team of scientists, because this aspect that I mentioned of the anticoagulation, which you will see uh, much more open than just in this discussion today in the, in the near future, was unbelievable. And that is all the investigators working together to help people. Anyway, these are my first reactions to what happened from mid-March and certainly up to recently. Yeah, so let, let me follow up on that. So essentially, all these patients are coming in um, very sick. In fact, you know, one day at Mount Sinai Hospital, 80 patients died in one single day. So patients are coming in. We're learning about the disease on the fly. Right, we didn't know exactly, you know, what the disease was all about, and so what? You know, you've been a, you've been a, a cardiologist for 50 years. Have you ever had an experience like that, where patients are coming and they're very sick, and you got to figure out on the fly what's the best way, uh, you know, to treat treat the patient? In this case, a cardiovascular problem. What was that like? Dennis, this was very dramatic. I have never seen this before. Like I have never seen the so-called acute research. Acute research, it doesn't even appear in the Google. Is this is actually a situation that for the first time you have to do something and you work on a hurry, but in a very step-by-step -step fashion. So in three months, we had six phases that led to what I presented today. So uh, I will say to you on personal basis, very, very dramatic. On the research basis, I have never seen this before a group of people working together, like Lala, who is there, who worked together very much with me in the project, and was uh, just amazing. So a combination of drama and a combination of motivation. Drama, what we saw. Motivation is what should do about it. So, you know, Mount Sinai Heart, w which integrates all, all of uh, heart clinical care and research, is considered by, you know, many one of the best uh, heart programs in the nation. And how important was it that, in a sense, we were prepared, you know, from, because we had outstanding doctors and researchers related to uh, the heart. How important it was that, in a sense, we were prepared to take on this challenge? Uh, Dennis, if I tell you the truth, we were prepared because we have a unified system. This is called Mount Sinai Heart, or a cardiovascular institute. But in fact, we all work together. The surgeons, he's Dr. Adams, the electrophysiologist, and we all work together. And I think we were already prepared to really address the issue. And the, ra the reason was, in my own view, because we know each other. We work together every day. We are not diffused in a system. This is Mount Sinai Heart, and I feel more proud than ever to see Mount Sinai Heart in action. Yeah, thank you. Well I'll get back to you with other questions. Uh, Dr. Adams, David Adams, one of the best mitral valve surgeons uh, in the world. But, you know, we had to postpone a lot of surgery and you, you became, you know, part of the, the medical core uh, to treat patients, you know, with the uh, infection. So what was that like for you, you know, as a, uh, as a surgeon uh, to, to deal with the infection uh, as it hit Mount Sinai? Uh, David, you're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, Dennis, I'll start by saying I like Valentin's word about drama. It was it was actually very dramatic because I think all the the staff and team were worried about patients, worried about themselves and their own families, helping at the same time. We had a, a formidable task trying to reorganize it. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what happened in our group over the first two or three weeks, about 90% of our whole department redeployed to the hospital to take care of COVID patients. Our ICUs were transformed to become COVID units and all of those personnel all moved to that. The other 10% were left with the task of trying to take care of the 125 such patients we had on the OR schedule for the next few months that were all scheduled. And of course the governor said no elective surgery, but most patients that are having heart surgery don't think it's elective. So we went through and we, my staff, the 10% that were left made a Herculean effort to contact each and every patient and explain to them what was going on. 
And then systematically along the way, we learned something, and that was about telehealth and medicine, just like I'm talking to you now, and everyone can see this screen in one of the offices that we do our consults in. We then went through the task of, of personally reaching out to every single patient the way I'm doing now and talking to them directly and explaining to them what we were up against, what they were up against. And we've gone through every chart. We prioritized what their priority level was for surgery, what their indication for surgery was and how long they can wait. And I must say it was incredible that experience. Everyone was very understanding. There was a lot of confidence in the system in the hospital and slowly but surely is this pandemic resolved itself in, in terms of controlling and giving us back our ICs and our resources. We were really prepared to go back and start doing heart surgery when we got the green light. And so far, we've done about 75 patients since we got the green light to start catching back up. And the telemedicine, I'll just say for everyone, has changed everything. My view of how cardiac surgery preparation and follow-up will be done in the future has completely changed. And I think I really believe if there's one silver lining of this crisis, it's that just, and I'll give you my quick example. Earlier, a few, a few minutes ago, I did a couple of open heart operations this morning, a few minutes ago before this call, I saw a, a psychologist that lives four hours away. She was in her office. She'd been working, seeing patients. I've been operating. She needs mitral surgery. So we had a 45 minute or a 50 minute consult with her and my team. And now she signed up for her surgery in a few, she actually has a fairly urgent problem. But instead of having to drive four hours here, park, wait for me, and all the stuff that goes on in our clinics, we were able to accomplish all that with telemedicine. And I explained to her that our next goal is to be able to help follow her postoperatively the same way. And I think this is just, if we get, once we get used to this, and we've got to make some investments in our technology and how we're going to record it, we're already starting to do that in terms of, of that. But in the future, I think, for fields that rely on imaging like ours, it's going to completely transform how we communicate and take care of patients. And I think that's one thing we've learned, and it's allowed us with everyone, and I will echo what Valentine said, the fact that this is a single heart institute, we were all very coordinated in our efforts. It led to groups like myself and Samines and Vivix being ready to really pick back up where we left off with our quality because our very specialized teams were all intact. Now, many individuals who have heart problems uh, are worried about what are the consequences of being infected uh, with the virus, it, and they have a pre-existing cardiac problem. What What do you want to say that that to that group of uh, individuals? Well, Dennis, I'll, I'll say that, that from our perspective, everything we've seen so far tells us it's extremely safe to come to this hospital and have procedures and have interventions. And as I said, we've seen no signal in all the operations we've done trying to catch up since we were allowed to start operating again. And there have been very strict guidelines and we have a lot of discipline about how we're testing patients, segregating them. And the, I, as I chuckle, we will never have to have another sign up in a hospital that says, wash your hands when you go into a patient room. Everybody is wearing masks, everyone's washing hands. I think we're gonna see in the long term a um, much stricter adoption of policies that are going to protect patients, not just from COVID, but other common things that happen in hospitals. So let me, just jump that, in for, let me jump in for a sec. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, that's an important point that we're going to get back to, that it's very safe to come to Mount Sinai and get your treatment. But here's my question regarding if you have an, a pre-existing cardiac problem, I'm going to ask everybody the same question. Sure. What is the increased risk, perhaps, of being infected if you, if you have a pre-existing cardiac problem in terms of the outcome of, of being infected, the clinical outcome? Sure, Dennis. I'll, I'll address the, the, the I certainly will, will defer to Dr. Fuster for the most common things that matter, like hypertension, diabetes, and some of the, and obesity, by the way, which are some of the risk factors that have clearly been linked to worse outcomes in patients that get COVID. We have less signals about structural heart disease that require cardiac surgery as a additional risk factor for COVID. Although patients that have advanced heart failure or advanced cardiac morbidity will certainly have less reserve if they get really sick from this virus. But um, our involvement from a structural standpoint for the really sick patients has really been around giving them support to, protect, to help their lungs other than the patients that develop 
cardiovascular crisis from myocarditis, and it's certainly everybody else on this call is better able to comment about that than I. Okay, let me go back to Valentin then. Uh, Valentin, so you know, what would you say uh, to patients with pre-existing cardiac disease? Uh, is there perhaps increased risk if they get infected? It is some increased risk, but let's be sure that we don't move into an extreme. The risk of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity as aging, you know, are certainly some risk to increase the, that increase the incidence of COVID and even mortality. But I think it would be wrong to go to our patients with cardiac disease and tell them, you know what, you are really in bad shape. I think what we have to do is the following. We have to follow our patients properly. Some had COVID and the heart was affected. And we really need to follow this very carefully in the future. But I think if all of us do the, our job, I would say, yes, the risk may be increased. But be sure that we don't overwhelm patients with an issue of pessimism because it's not the case. OK, let me let me move then to Dr. Sharma, um, our interventional cardiologist, uh, you know, expert. Uh, first, let me just ask you, Samine, you know, what was it like for you during the uh, the height of the pandemic? You're on mute, please. As mentioned by you and uh, Dr. Fuster and uh, everyone, uh, Dr. Adams, that it hit us as a tsunami. I mean, nobody expected uh, that it will be that dramatic. And it was. And particularly, the patients who were really sick, being in ICUs and taking care of them. And uh, every day, the, we were hearing that how many patients are losing their lives because of this disease, which we learn while taking care. And one of the emotional part was my all the, our cardiology fellows were deployed to take care of the patients, COVID patients in the ICU. And they actually took care of a majority of those units in KCC by round the clock uh, coverage. And my son, being an interventional uh, fellow at present, as a father, I, you know, think, thought, you know, why you have to work in the ICU? But at the same time, as a doctor, the responsibility is that, yes, we need, we need to take care of these patients. That uh, also we learn that with the adequate protective gears, and you take care of yourself while you're taking care of the sick patient, you'll not develop the disease. So question always was, and for many uh, our the workers, that are you going to develop disease if you take care of COVID patients? Answer to that is, if you take adequate precautions yourself and use all the protective equipment and gears and mask shields and appropriate uh, the dress up and uh, so, chances that you'll develop the disease, you'll contact the disease from those patients is very, very minimal, almost nil. So let me ask you the same question that I was asking uh, Valentin and, and David. Uh, if a patient has pre-existing cardiovascular disease, uh, what, what is there, is there increased risk of, you know, heart problems if they get the COVID infection? You know, how, how would that patient have to be treated it, it, it differently if, uh, than, say, a patient that did not have pre-existing cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so, um, Dennis, that's a great question. And this question, everybody kept asking all the time. And that is the patients who have particularly risk factors, they had a higher complication of once they develop the COVID infection. So but what does that mean? It basically means that you need to control their basic risk factors, whether it's a diabetes, blood pressure, high blood pressure, obesity, and those, yes, those were especially prone. But at the same time, even those patients, if they take adequate precaution, chances that they will develop COVID just little. Uh, with not much increase. What is increased in all the studies uh, which came out even from Mount Sinai, that particular group of patients, age more than 65, those who have coronary artery disease, those who have diabetes and lung disease, and also obesity came out to be a very important factor that they have higher complication of COVID once they contracted the disease. And in terms of you know where we are now, you know, as, as you know, we're now open for business, which is very important because, you know, many patients, you know, couldn't get treatment and that they really needed. Um, and, and we didn't want their disease to get, you know, worse while we were dealing 
with the pandemic. So is the cath lab open now? Um, you know, what precautions you're, you're now taking, you know, for your patients? Absolutely. So Dennis, I will answer this question in two, uh, two phases, two parts. One part was very unusual phenomena, which we noted that while COVID patients were coming, our emergency room or ICUs were full, getting filled, our cardiac patient heart attack, acute heart attacks were significantly declined. We all were surprised that maybe many of the patients are waiting at home. But at the same time, then we heard reports from various countries, similar phenomena, including in many centers in the United States, that during the COVID time, the patients developing heart attack really decreased. And there are various explanations which we have published. Some of them could be very simple. That is, during COVID, we have less air pollution. People stayed home, relaxed. They ate a good food not the restaurant food with a high fatty meal and high salt. This really <laughs> creates many of the acute episodes. So took care of themselves, more meditation, exercise. So those factors. So now once those factors were done, now we are at the time that these patients who delayed their care, we rightly so, but now yeah. they need the care and we are ready for it. So question comes, the, and this we deal every day. Gradual phase, bringing those patients in a very, controlled environment, avoiding overcrowding right before, at the time they come for registration. And more importantly, that before even they come, that every patient is screened for COVID symptoms and before as well as after arrival. And of course, for invasive procedures, Mount Sinai and like many centers has uh, made it essential that they have to be tested for COVID. So those patients who are COVID positive, but yeah. their heart condition is not urgent, we wait. We don't do the procedure, but otherwise, the every precaution being taken in terms of uh, not avoiding overcrowding, treating, of course, the staff who is taking care of them are COVID free. And most importantly, that after procedure is done, they go to a unit, which is COVID free unit. So they are not mingling with the patients who have COVID. We do take care of the COVID patients, but those now, since the patients started coming back, elective procedures, procedures, procedures are being done which our number in the cath lab is already 82% of our pre-COVID uh, era. And uh, so far with the system in place and of course all the resources available to us through the hospital and uh, personal level by our staff that uh, we have done a great job and nobody has contracted with this system, the COVID while being treated for our, in the cath lab. So, I mean, two messages. One that's very interesting is that 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 the the incidence of heart attacks was lower, and so it uh, points out the importance of prevention, uh, good diet, exercise, all the things that we uh, we say are important. It looked like they really they really are important. And and the other message is, we are paying enormous attention to safety for our patients, and that and it's working. Absolutely. So patients should feel, you know, comfortable, uh, confident that if they need the treatment, they can get it at this point. They should come in. Absolutely. Let me move to Dr. McLaughlin. And, you know, got a couple of questions. You know, first, what was, um, like I'm asking everybody else, uh, what was the experience, uh, Marianne, uh, like for you in dealing with the COVID uh, crisis? And and was there the difference between how men and women, uh, you know, reacted to getting infected? But first, tell me, what was it like for you personally uh, to deal with the pandemic? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tarney, for allowing me to participate here. Um, I'll tell you that what happened in my office was that I immediately started receiving phone calls about how patients with coronary disease, hypertension, history of valve surgery could mitigate their risk of having the infection. They had heard in the news that they were at increased risk. Um, and my advice is talking about inflammation and immunity those are the ways we have to treat this response to this disease. Patients had heard in the news that certain blood pressure medications may not be good for them. Um, but luckily, soon we were able to tell them that no, in fact, the research is going in the opposite direction. Maintain your blood pressure medications. Do not stop your blood, med blood pressure medications. Mount Sinai was dedicated to getting this information out quickly to all the patients. Secondly, we received calls that patients were having shortness of breath and they were afraid to go to the ER. We were very quick to facilitate the telehealth visits 
triage those who needed to be seen and encourage the use of home monitors, home blood pressure monitors, pulse oximeters to measure oxygen and thermometers to measure temperature. We were able to, to work with them daily and talk to them about their symptoms and decide who then became more ill. Our advice included measures to reduce the exposure to the virus, as we've heard on the news, by wearing masks and protecting ourselves, but also to strengthen immunity and maintain healthy intake of vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc, um, which have been shown to reduce the impact of virus um, and, and patients. We advise patients to reduce their sugar intake, to continue exercise in their homes or in their neighborhoods to reduce inflammation in the body. We know that inflammation increases risk of illness. Finally, we had patients calling with symptoms that were not like the flu, severe back pain, chest pain that was constant, unlike anything they had had before with their cardiac illness. We quickly facilitated them to be seen in our urgent care centers and admitted them directly to the hospital for those who were ill. I know we've talked about the elderly being at increased risk, but I have at least 12 to 15 patients over the age of 80 that had this disease and did quite well. Um, we ha I have a 96 year old patient who was able to come to the hospital quickly and receive the life saving plasma, antibody plasma injections and be discharged within four days of admission. So people who learn to keep fit, take their medications um, and avoid these stressors were able to do well despite this terrible disease. We learned an immense amount of information quickly due to sharing of information with colleagues. We spoke with Dr. Fruther daily, who was in touch with people around the world who had seen more episodes of COVID and taught us their observations. Um, and when you asked about men and women, what I would say yeah. is to date, the evidence is that um, the susceptibility to the virus is similar, but in general up to now, they're saying that men, more men have died from the disease than women. But looking at this gives us a window to see how many you may understand and who gets this disease, who recovers, and how um, to prevent this from happening to more people. We need to analyze more robust data about disease outcomes by age, sex, race, socioeconomic background. And on April 22nd, a paper was published in JAMA that found 5,700 patients in New York City hospitalized with COVID, 60% were men. One theory is that testosterone and estrogen may affect inflammatory responses in different ways. So similar to the research that I've been involved with after the tragic disaster of September 11th, my research team is involved in designing a registry of patients with cardiac risk. I'm working with Dr. Fuster, Dr. Lala, and others on this call to examine the relationship between high blood pressure, prediabetes, inflammation, obstructive sleep apnea, and sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen and their effect on COVID. When we talk about women's health, an important issue is to evaluate women who are coming in with chest pain. In general, more women than men can have chest pain and heart attacks without having the classic blockages of cholesterol in their arteries. There can be small vessels that are Importantly, there is one particular type called spontaneous coronary artery dissection which results from changes in hormones in women during pregnancy, after pregnancy, during menopause, that increases the risk of thrombosis and also causes a tear in an artery. So there have been several case reports through this COVID at many institutions that they're seeing more patients coming in with chest pain, a little bit different than usual and having these tears in their arteries. So Dr. Bullen, one of the world leading experts here, and we are working with him and to, to make sure that we can develop strategies to address this important issue. So I just wanted to say in summary that this pandemic has brought a great loss of life to New Yorkers and many of the people on the phone, and we share your grief. During this unprecedented time, we've witnessed incredible strength and resilience, as Dr. Charney has taught us, um, uh, and collaboration, especially with Dr. Fuster. And we appreciate your support to all the listeners as we move forward with strategies to precisely identify the cardiac risks and how important it is to implement therapies to maintain and improve heart health during this COVID pandemic. Thank you, Marianne. You know, that was very inspirational. And, you know, you've highlighted some you know, very important uh, areas that we need to continue to do uh, research that ultimately will help 
our patients. So, you know, again, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me move to Dr. Uh, Reddy. Uh, Dr. Reddy, you led a team of doctors on the front line uh, during the peak of the pandemic. What was that like for you? Uh, thanks, Dr. Chani, first for um, having me involved in this uh, discussion. Um, you know, as previously said, I don't think there was any hospital in the country, or even the world, that was actually prepared for this pandemic. So um, many of us were deployed, uh, certainly at all levels, physicians, um, the fellows, the nurses, the techs, um, uh, office staff, we were all redeployed in different times to really try to help with this crisis. So um, I and actually all of the fellows in our section and several of the other attendants in our section did serve on the COVID floors to to try, try to take care of the patients. And I guess there are a couple of points I'd make. One is just the selflessness of it. Um, you know, it's, it's easy actually to, uh, to put yourself at risk, but to actually put your family at risk is actually much more difficult. And, you know, many of the nurses and other people that volunteered in our section actually did get sick, including passing it on to their families. So it was really, you know, quite a, um, uh, quite a sacrifice to go through all of that. Um, the second thing I think is, you know, I was actually struck by the, the camaraderie on the floors itself. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easy to sort of think back now that we know more about the disease, but at the time we really didn't know very much. We knew a little bit from China and of course the horrific stories we heard from Italy at the time, and we had no idea how bad this was really gonna be. For all we knew, this is gonna be like Ebola when we, when we came here. Fortunately, it wasn't that bad, but still the, the fact that people, you know, were professional and did everything they needed to do to take care of patients. The other point is, um, you know, from the patient perspective, I, this is a very frightening situation, I think, you know. Patients don't know what's gonna happen to them. They hear all these things, it's 24 seven on the news about COVID. And they come into the hospital and they're isolated. Everybody's wearing a mask. Nobody uh, is actually touching the patients um, with, their, you know, with their hands, uh, you know, without gloves, et cetera. And I was actually struck that many people at different levels would take time, more time than they needed to, to talk to the patient just to, you know, comfort them. So I think that was that really spoke really well of the of the Mount Sinai um, uh, sort of uh, philosophy and um, and the the way that we uh, dealt with patients. And finally, and, I, and this has already been said by others too, but just the amount of uh, effort that everyone from every single section, uh, we're obviously cardiologists, but even the other sections were putting on this really infectious disease issue. Um, you know, we all became a little bit of experts in, uh, in virology during this time. And the amount of work that uh, the fellows and the other attendings and everyone did to try to contribute and um, add to our understanding of the disease was really, I think, extraordinary. Well, thank you for that. That's also very inspiring. As an expert in arrhythmias, what did you learn about, uh, one, if somebody is vulnerable to arrhythmias, what did the infection uh, do to that? And um, did the virus itself cause arrhythmias in, in terms of the uh, disease? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. We had some, some hints about this from data from, or from manuscripts from China. But uh, when we actually looked at our own data, um, what we found was a couple of things. First, when you think about the really dangerous arrhythmias, the arrhythmias from the bottom chambers of the heart, um, we did see them, but fortunately they didn't occur that frequently. So that was a good news. Um, we also, there were also arrhythmias that cause slow heart rhythms. And it turned out that that does happen in patients with COVID. Oftentimes in people who have heart attacks, then then require, then then uh, uh, one of the results of the heart attack is a slow heart rhythm requiring pacing therapy. And the final, and this is actually ongoing work, what we're finding is that atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common heart rhythm problems affecting the top chambers of the heart, increase the risk of stroke and other things. This actually is increased in patients with COVID. Um, the, our data indicates that about one in 10 uh, individuals who develop COVID in the hospital or who develop COVID and are in the hospital will sustain atrial fibrillation. And actually this is um, active ongoing work. And I think it has implications even in the future after patients recover, I think many of us believe that this probably will um, be an issue. And I think some of the work that Marianne Glock and others are doing in terms of following patients is gonna be really instrumental to, to teasing this out. Um, the so other one question would be oh, if they develop AFib, yeah. AFib, atrial fibrillation, will that continue to be a problem after they've recovered from the infection? Absolutely. Um, that's an important question. We don't have the answer to that. It's something that uh, we need to follow because 
if they do, then that means they're going to be at high risk for stroke and other heart failure and other um, uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Um, the other interesting thing about about uh, COVID, you know, there are many medications we treat with COVID, and one of them that uh, certainly was used earlier and now has fallen out of favor as we got more data is hydroxychloroquine, which actually can cause pretty important changes in the electrophysiology of the heart, and even can cause dangerous life-threatening arrhythmias. Uh, so we did a lot of work in terms of how to monitor the patients or during their hospitalization, et cetera. Fortunately, with all of the precautions that were taken, there are very few, if any, patients who actually had these sustained arrhythmias that resulted in, um, in mortality. So we were happy about that. And then the final point I guess I'd make, because many of our patients have devices, whether it's pacemakers or defibrillators or whatever, and, um, and they're concerned, understandably, about whether what this means if they get COVID. So there's two points I want to make. One, the fact that they have these devices does not put them at increased risk for COVID. And as best we can tell, the fact that they have the devices doesn't increase their risk of having poor cardiovascular outcomes as a result of COVID. Now, it is true, however, that patients who have these devices are typically patients who are older, who have high blood pressure, who have heart failure and other issues. And because of that, they may be at higher risk of adverse outcomes for COVID. Well, so much important information. You know, thank you for sharing all of that. I'd like to, you know, move to uh, Dr. Lala, and like I've asked everybody else, you know, what was it like for you to face uh, this pandemic and the fight? And then, uh, can you speak to, uh, you know, whether or not uh, any were, was there damage to the heart as a result to the uh, as a result of the infection? Sure, thank you so much, Dean Charney, for involving me in this really important conversation amongst the luminaries on this call, as you pointed out. I think I'd like to, to stress uh, three main points, uh, the first being on heart failure care during the pandemic, the second to answer your question on research, and then finally, where we plan to go at Mount Sinai Heart in terms of heart failure care as we emerge out of the pandemic. I think on a personal level, as you've asked everyone else, uh, I think everyone has summed up a lot of the sentiments uh, beautifully. It's dramatic, it's frightening. It was also oddly inspiring. Um, uh, Dr. Fuster and Dr. Sharma had did a wonderful job of really integrating the group. Dr. Fuster, as you heard, had calls daily, and it made uh, all of us, quite frankly, feel more reassured. Um, being able to take care of the In terms of the heart failure care, obviously this is a very vulnerable population of patients. We have patients who are awaiting heart transplantation, patients who have already received heart transplants, and then people who also have mechanical circulatory support devices or LVADs to support the heart as they wait for transplant. And so not only did many of us get deployed in care of the general population with COVID, but we actually created specific services of COVID and non-COVID heart transplant patients so we could segregate them and not expose uh, patients who are not affected to those who are affected. So we effectively ran double the number of services that we would normally do in order to keep our patients safe. And I'm very happy to report that our outcomes, uh, despite these patients being more vulnerable by virtue of how sick they could be, were similar to the general population, which uh, we are really proud of. Specifically, we also had a lot of difficult decisions to make. Obviously, in the field of heart transplantation, this is a life-saving therapy, and patients who are awaiting heart transplantation are extremely ill. But we had to really weigh the, the benefits of, of performing these life-saving procedures with the risk of contracting COVID, infection control, and generalized exposure. And I can say that very proud to report, and Dr. Adams knows this and is an incredible supporter uh, of the program, we were able to perform five tran heart transplants during the peak of the pandemic um, in highly selective patients where we felt that the benefit far outweighed the risk. And I'm also really proud to report that those patients have done remarkably well, thankfully, and it really allowed us to come together even more than we already do to take every possible precaution to ensure that, that outcomes were favorable. And we've actually also uh, a paper of ours on this experience of both patients who were admitted with COVID with a history of heart transplant, as well as the five heart transplants that were performed 
specifically for Dr. Anwanyu during this, uh, the peak of the pandemic, will be published soon. Um, the second point I wanted to comment on was the research aspect of things, which Dr. Fuster really nicely touched upon uh, thus far. I think Mount Sinai showed the strength of its infrastructure and its expertise during this pandemic in that it was uh, able to bring together in record time uh, experts across many different specialties to form the Mount Sinai COVID informatics center, which allowed a rapid collection of a lot of data and the dissemination of that data and information to inform how we took care of patients with COVID. And specifically, I think you've already alluded to to one of the projects that I was involved with, uh, with Dr. Fuster and others, was how often was heart involved in COVID? That uh, the, the fact that COVID infects the lungs was very well publicized, but it was a question as to how often the heart was involved. And we actually did a study here at Mount Sinai, and Dr. Fuster is the senior author of the study that's been published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, where we looked at 2,700 patients across the Mount Sinai health system, and we found that a third of the patients had some evidence of heart damage at low levels. Now, what does that exactly mean? Essentially, there's a blood test that is done within on admission or presentation to the emergency room that can signify heart damage. And we found that it was present, as I mentioned, in over a third of patients who were COVID positive. If you had a history of cardiovascular disease or risk factors, you were more likely to have uh, this marker of heart damage as uh, on blood tests. And what we found is independent of whether you had a history of cardiovascular risk factors or not, it was actually this marker of heart damage that uh, was associated with worse outcomes, specifically higher uh, death rate. It's critically important though to place these findings in context. It's not to scare those patients away in those patients who have a history of cardiovascular disease, it's not just in the way, but it's actually more, I, I took it in the positive light that it helped inform some of our triaging of these patients. So if a patient presented to the emergency room, had a history of cardiovascular disease, and then also had evidence of some heart damage that was occurring in terms of tests, it would make us think about those patients in a little bit of a different way, have a higher threshold um, to discharge them, for example, or a lower threshold to transfer them to a unit where they would be observed more closely. So I thought those findings were really helpful. We've also been looking at readmissions um, and how often that occurred uh, throughout the system. And I think really importantly, uh, under Dr. Peter's guidance and leadership and Dr. McLaughlin's, as you already heard, we plan on studying these patients uh, longitudinally to better understand the long-term effects of COVID-19. System. So that that's going to be very important uh, to follow these patients and see you know what the long term effects are. Uh, Valentine, I'd like to you know get back to you. Um, you know when I listen to uh, what everybody's experience is and what they have done during this uh, pandemic and the fight, I mean it feels like a dream team mm -hmm. of everybody working together. You know bringing enormous expertise from almost every. Uh, level, you know, where where do you th see things going, Valentin? You know, now in the future, in in terms of our cardiac program at Mount Sinai, uh, developing new techniques to treat patients, uh, uh, doing research that leads to better treatments. Uh, Valentin, could you comment on that? What is the future? Well, first of all, cardiovascular disease still is the number one uh, cause of mortality today in the world. So. We talk about an acute situation up until now, but the question is we have a disease that we have to do something about it. And I think uh, to me, we have to invest a lot on research. Uh, as you can imagine, this is the way that we will be able at the very end to say we are not the number one killer. First of all, I think we need to have research that really is about what is health. This is critical. And that is, we all talk about disease, but the question is how, what is health and how can we promote health? That's number one. And number two is obviously to address the issues of disease. Now, what is fascinating is if I go back personally about uh, 30 years ago and today, the tremendous uh, uh, advances in technology 
uh, have been so huge that now we are really facing the following situation. We have a lot about it. We have a lot of technology that can tell us actually um, insights about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular health. But we need also computerized systems. We have to, how can we put big data together? How we get into genetics and to pull together the whole aspect of genetics, big data, computerized approaches, which is the near future. So I will tell you the following. Um, if I have to define cardiology in the future, I, I don't want to dismiss the importance of patients. I love seeing patients, but I have to tell you the academic and the research are going to be absolutely critical to really overcome this number one killer today. And imaging, electrophysiology, intervention, surgery, uh, computerization, all these aspects are really in front of us and we have to really address them. So uh, thank you. D David, um, I'm gonna ask you to think out of the box as one of the world's leading cardiac surgeons. Yeah, you know, where is cardiac surgery going to go, be going over the next five years? You know, if you look into your crystal ball. Dennis, I'll, I'll uh, say again, I think that car cardiac surgery is going to do the following. We're going to intervene earlier than ever. Cardiac surgery and intervention in general, Samina Vivek, I'm sure will agree, has gotten safer and more predictable than ever. And so we're going to intervene earlier. We're not going to wait because of risk to let the heart get damaged as an indication to do procedures. The second thing I think you're going to see is just continued advancement in terms of, of how, how minimal the invasiveness of the procedure is. And what I mean by that is not how big or little your incision is or whether you go back to work in two weeks or three weeks, but you know, can you have these procedures, preserve your own tissue, avoid transfusions, and restore your normal quality of life and normal length of life with really a minimal investment in terms of, of, of conditions that affect you or your family. And I think we're getting there, and I think the, the work that we're all doing collectively is helping us get there. And the last thing I'll say is I absolutely believe if I've learned one thing from this experience, a lot can, a lot will change with telemedicine, telehealth, your interactions with physicians, how you're followed up, not just for uh, big things like structural heart problems and heart surgery, but little things like my blood pressure medicine myself. I haven't gone to see my doctor for a few years either. If I could do that with telemedicine, I probably would have already done it. And I, I think all of us are going to see that the ability to take care of patients and particularly in centers like this where Many of our patients come from all over the country, and some of you are on the on the call today. The ability to inter interact with you and follow you and help take care of you remotely is going to be transformative, not only for patients that, that have the already the knowledge to do it, but it's also going to level the playing field. I really believe that I want to provide more access to more patients, including patients that don't have the ability to come to places like this for second opinions. And I absolutely believe cardiac surgery will be one of the leading specialties and cardiology is gonna be one of the leading specialties in terms of this whole movement toward telemedicine. Yeah, you know, that, that is one of the silver linings of, of this uh, pandemic. You know, we went from, you know, j just doing like 50 uh, telemedicine visits a, a day to thousands. So we, we have learned and how, how important virtual care can be. And Dennis, and, and the other thing about virtual care that we learned was, you know, some of the restrictions currently in place that kept us from being able to do that virtual medicine was relaxed during the crisis. And I think you're going to see a groundswell of support from physicians to, to re-examine this so that we can cross state lines and help take care of patients in real time and not and, and and again it was relaxed and our I saw an article today from one of the senators saying it's time to really revisit that and I absolutely believe this is a priority for, for the cardiovascular medicine and disease and I plan to enlist Dr. Fuster and many others in getting our associations and societies behind this. Great. So uh Samin, get your crystal ball out. <laughs> Where's interventional cardiology going over the next uh a couple of years. Yep. Well, I I would say that uh, the interventional cardiology basically is the two three parts actually. One is the coronary, 
second is the peripheral, which is the arteries of the leg and the brain and so. And the third is the valve, which you call structure. So clearly the coronaries, you learn now that overall, because of the better control of the risk factors, patients compliant with the medicines, going to the doctor and more careful, the incidence is going down. So coronary artery disease requiring intervention will go down and similarly, I know it's the, nothing with the Dr. Adams, but both PCI, which is the percutaneous uh, intervention as well as surgical uh, bypass surgery, all numbers will continue to decline and which we have seen it uh, over last few years. What is going to increase is the structure because patients are living longer, they're surviving and uh, the wall damage, whether it's the aortic or mitral, and whether it requires surgical uh, correction or non-surgical correction, though all will continue to increase. Now, one thing also I wanted to point in this, that while now this COVID situation is over, we are seeing patients is still very much afraid and they're coming late in their game. What does that mean? They started having a small, I mean, chest pain, had a small heart attack could have been two days ago. Now they wait two days and then come to the hospital. Now their condition is more serious. So just want to emphasize, I know we have a lot of our uh, patients and uh, the well-wishers on the line, just to convey that message that if you need a treatment for your acute heart condition, waiting is not a way to go. It is risk of developing COVID is very minimal and the timely treatment is very useful to take care of the problem right away and improve overall prognosis and survival. Thank you very much. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, let me just ask everybody to go on mute, except the person I'm talking to, because we have a little bit of an echo. Um, Vivek, um, you get your crystal ball out too. You know, I must admit, it seems like I know a lot more people having problems with atrial fibrillation, um, you know, than before. I don't, I don't know if that's, you know, real uh, or not, but it just seems a lot more common. So where is the treatment of, you know, abnormal heart rhythm you know, going in the future. And you know, let me just remind you, we only have about two minutes left. No, no problem. Um, well, it's actually true. There are more and more people with atrial fibrillation. Part of that's related to as, the, as our whole society ages uh, and atrial fibrillation occurs in older people, that happens, that we'll see more of it. The other part is that there are other factors like obesity and metabolic disease that occur and have been occurring in our, in our population. And that also increased the amount of atrial fibrillation. Now, one of the ways we can treat atrial fibrillation is with catheter procedures. And we've been doing this now for a couple of decades um, and we've gotten pretty good at it. In fact, it's the most common procedure that I do. What's really interesting in our field is there's a real revolution that's about to happen. It actually is happening. Um, the way we do ablation now is we take a catheter and we heat up tissue, we cauterize it inside the body and that gets rid of the atrial fibrillation. The problem with that is that's a relatively tissue indiscriminate way of, of of, um, of ablation. So we ablate the heart tissue, but then we may also ablate tissue that we don't want to affect uh, other structures, and that can have some safety uh, considerations. Fortunately, that doesn't happen very often, but also fortunately, there's going to be a change in the way we do ablation. So instead of heating up tissue, we're using a new energy source called pulse field ablation. This is something that um, uh, Mount Sinai, our uh, uh, physicians, we participated in studies in Europe and showed that this was possible. We're actually the first ones in the world to do this. So that it was possible, that it's safe, and it has some real advantages. And in fact, it's now coming to the United States. We're gonna be, Mount Sinai will be actually the lead center in a very large randomized trial looking at this new therapy, which is really gonna revolutionize um, the treatment of atrial fibrillation in, uh, in our field. So we're actually very excited about this. Thank you very much. So, you know, I'd like to thank all the panelists and, and you know, the audience that is listening in. Uh, I hope, you know, you've got the impression of, of the passion, um, the dedication, frankly, the brilliance uh, of Mount Sinai Heart. And, you know, our goals as an institution is, is nothing less than providing the best treatment available and just as important, pushing the envelope to make discoveries that will change the lives of our patients with heart disease. Thank you all. Thank you all very much uh, for the work that you do.